how did we get on to talking about reggae from Tom Waits? I feel like a strange puppeteer who we can make you all dance a conversation. I think I might just chuck out Jamiroquai, guys. How, how dare you take credit for this? We're just supremely good at waffling. <laughs> Professional <laughs> bollocks talkers. Exactly. <laughs> I'll tell you what, who else is bollocks? DJ Khalid. And welcome to episode five of the Cacophony Sessions podcast. Five! Where's the time gone? This evening, the Cacophony Sessions goes pop as we flirt with the UK official singles chart top ten. We're going out of our comfort zone. Uh, we're going to find out what's going on with the youth of today. Youth. Yeah, the youth indeed. This is the UK top ten as of the 30th of August 2020. My name is Dan, and tonight there are some whores in this house. And their names are Dave, Al, Martin, and Tom. Hello. Hello. How are we all? Getting over a hangover, as usual. Yep, it's nice. <laughs> Standard for a Cacophony Sessions podcast. I don't normally drink that much, but every time we have one of these, I seem to have either got the day off the next day, so drinking a skinful, or recovering from the night before sounds like a good thing i mean i'm currently drinking right now i haven't started yet i don't i think i'm still a little bit too delicate what's everyone been doing then well i've been following the tour de france because it's one of the sports that we have in our country where we are consistently um have some of the best athletes in the world and currently adam yates is wearing the yellow jersey he's top of the fucking game um so yeah i'm really enjoying that at the moment uh, other than working as well working a lot which i always do uh say that every podcast it's all about work but anyway um i've been um i've been listening to some really really cool stuff there's a band that i really love called the uh <laughs> the neurotic road parsons <laughs> <laughs> aka the manic street preachers maybe yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, pointless there for that somebody one. Sent, somebody sent me that pointless thing and i was just like that's amazing they they, they truly missed the trick not calling themselves the, the neurotic road parsons <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful it's beautiful um so yeah yeah man. And, and i've been writing this song for you dan like i've been working my ass off on this uh power pop song and uh challenged me totally where but i i thought what well, i could throw it out in two minutes because i can do that sort of thing yeah i can do like you know a straight up guitar track Actually, it was way harder than I thought it would be, and um, just arranging it was just my god. Like just even getting the fucking middle eight section right was hard enough. So I've been working really hard on that, and um, hopefully you enjoy the uh, arrangement. But it needs re-recording because I recorded it while drunk, so like the timing is all off. Timing is all off, and that's that garage feel. Yeah, it's a bit too garage, and uh, I need to make it less garage and a little bit more kind of like polished. I'm working a lot as as always, um, like back to work. Uh, I was w- worked a full week last week for the first time in a long time, which was quite nice. But um, I finally just having having had discussions on our podcast group chat about getting a musical project off the ground, I decided it was finally t- because more than one of us play bass um i decided it was time to get my to restring my thin line fender telecaster um and i've stuck some good strings on it tuned it down to c and uh, i'm working in writing some some music um that's that's going to be a bit heavier um and to work alongside doing some synth parts and i know that once I get some of that sort of stuff together, I'm sure Martin will be quite into that. Um, although you don't have to tune your guitar down to C, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think my guitars can take it, but no. I'll give I it a go. Yeah, I didn't think mine could either, but I was listening to I was listening to a lot of Deftones and just that guitar sound is just so beautiful. I wanted to do it and um, I, I'm too tight to go and buy a nine string guitar. So I've just down tuned to C instead. Um and then music listening to uh new smashing pumpkins songs 
Um, in case anyone hadn't realised already, I am a humongous Smashing Pumpkins fan. I own, I think, if of their official discography, I think there's only about five individual items that I don't own. Which is Do a bit... you have Gish? Yes. <laughs> Final. I have which Gish. In, it is in the top three Smashing it's Pumpkins. It's not in the top three. It's but I have, I have the 91 original stop, vinyl stop pressing. Stop living in denial, man. If you're just listening now, you are listening to the Smashing Pumpkins podcast, which we seem to do every single week. I know, but they released something new. <laughs> and it was actually all right. <laughs> just to fill everyone in who's listening, we do have a group chat where we have been debating the top five Smashing Pumpkins albums for the last sort of week. And Martin is the only person who thinks Gish is in the top three. So this is a touchy subject. Gish is number two, man. No. All the way. You cannot put Gish above either Melancholy <laughs> yes, or Siamese can. Dream. It, it no. goes this way. It goes this way. It goes Siamese Dream, then Gish, then Melancholy, then Don't Bother With The Pumpkins Anymore. Incorrect. Uvavu. They haven't released a bad album. Well, there are albums that are less good than others, but there's none of them that I wouldn't listen to all the way through, which, as we'll hear when we talk about chart music later, there are lots of other things that I wouldn't listen to all the way through. But yeah, then two new tracks came out. It's completely unlike anything they've done before. Um, and I actually quite liked it. Um, had a nice sort of pop feel to it, um, which, which is quite unlike them. What's the single called? It's written C-Y-R, so I've been calling it C-Y-R, but I'm sure it's pronounced in a way. Well, I'm going to annoy you, Tom. That single is worse than about three or four of the songs we listen to in the charts. Oh, I wouldn't know that. Do you deal with that? (laughs) I don't think there's anything worse than what we've had to listen to. I disagree, I disagree, and we'll get onto that in a bit more detail in a bit. Dave, what have you been up to? Uh, so last week was record store day, and I've it been was buying people. vinyl like a furious beast. So I bought um, two box sets of seven inches from Brazil, one uh, curated by DJ Format, and one just entitled Brazil Funk Power. Both were really good. They were just sort of rare for me lives that have been repressed that I would have never got access to unless I was probably digging through the crates in Brazil. So they were both nice to have. Uh, I got a live version of David Bowie's 74 uh, tour. Um, it was entitled I'm Only Dancing. And it's kind of like his big soul band play his sort of hits and then the new stuff that he'd released that year. So that's good. Um, and Dave, yep. you are Huey off the Six Music Show, and I claim my five pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a program on the BBC I play about Latin music. So that's quite a good watch if you haven't got round to have a look at that. And I've been listening to uh, his musical uh, odyssey on Six Music that he's been doing, so that's been good. Uh, but yeah, I also got. Um, Notorious B.I.G.'s Ready to Die album, which was re-released all on seven inches. That's a good album. So, that was, so yeah, that's really good. And have for them all, have all those records uh, on seven is great because they were never released on sevens originally. And as everybody knows, I love 45 records. So that's been good. And then loads of other stuff in secondhand shops. But yeah, just probably spending too much money on vinyl. You can never spend too much money on vinyl. You can when you haven't got enough money to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd rather live on pot noodles with good vinyl than the other way around. Pasta and ketchup for the next month, is it? <laughs> Contrary to delicious vinyl record label, I would pick. Oh, I know that vinyl. Oh, name some name some artists of delicious vinyl. I remember um, Tone Look. Yeah, Tone Look. They did a lot of uh, a lot of the nineties uh, hip hop was delicious vinyl, if I remember mm-hmm. right. Some guy just tucking in yeah. to a vinyl. With uh, a big you bite mentioned mark out of it. You mentioned DJ Format. Didn't he release an album like in uh, the 2000s? It was like kind of a DJ Shadow type thing where it was him doing like really old school beats and stuff and like really old school, really decent sampled hip hop, but with like loads of guest vocalists. Doesn't surprise me. His record collection is insane. If you ever go on to YouTube and have a look at Mass Appeal, um, I can't remember what the actual... Um, programs called but they go and look at famous hip hop heads record collection space it's really interesting so like Jazzy Jeff's there um, Cypress Hill loads of old radio DJs from New York and stuff but yeah he's on it and his record collection's in a spe- yeah. he's bought uh, a big house for his parents when he made it 
and they converted a stables <laughs> into his record collection outhouse building. So it's just like a huge area filled with vinyl. Cool. Al, what have you been doing? Well, I always feel like really unproductive when I talk to you guys. Because like, but oh, I bought loads of records. Oh, I've restringed my guitar. I've been writing some songs. I've got a drum kit. Haven't reskinned it. Haven't played it in about over a year. You know, I've listened to any new music at all. I've literally, as I said in the previous podcast, the chronic shuffler. Like all my music is on my phone. Hit shuffle, listening in the car at work, and let's go to work and vice versa. So no new music at all. The only thing I've been doing is I started watching The Fool on Netflix. Have anyone seen that? That's the Gillian Anderson um, thing, isn't it? With uh, about a um, she's a um, a detective and like the guy is like a, a, yeah. a psychopath. <laughs> who's like kind of he he's really good looking and stuff but is it as good as line of duty no there's very few things that are as good as line of duty line of duty yeah. is a class of its own it's absolutely wonderful i've been like, rewatching the wire recently as well the wire. The wire. The oh my program. god the wire the wire is literally the best tv program ever made by anybody mm-hmm. anywhere I've the tried it so many times. Oh mm. uh, man, it's one of those things. I've I've watched The Wire from episode one to the end, um, probably about three or four times. And every time you watch it, there's something new to discover. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. <laughs> to the main bulk of tonight's conversation, which is the top 10, current UK top 10. Um, and at number 10 is DJ Khalid featuring Drake with the song Grease. What did everybody think? I, I really want to ask a question first. What does DJ Khalid actually do in this track? He shouts his own name. Yeah, at the beginning. And then the, the rhythm part apparently was written by the producer, who's a guy called OZ. Um, and then Drake sings over the top. So what does DJ Khaled actually do? He, he do? says, another one, we the best, DJ Khaled, and then he's out and he gets his paycheck and he's on his jet ski eating pies mm-hmm. again or whatever he gets up to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that guy has got some serious business sense. I, I, I'm i aware of the fact that he exists, but yeah, I still have yet to fathom <laughs> anything that he actually does other than say his own name. Uh, it's well, actually he doesn't write again. Uh, I he, didn't write the, he didn't write the music on this track, no. But when you say write the music, does, like, isn't that usually like, you know, if, for example, if there's a guitar riff, he just nicked a riff and sampled it. Like, is that, but technically the other guy wrote it. You see what I mean? Like The the, he... sam- the sample that they used in the track was apparently written and released with German lyrics earlier this year by a guy, by the producer of the track called OZ, apparently. I don't know if he's uh, even... Yeah. So that's that's what I read. Um, I may, you know, that was Wikipedia, the font of all knowledge, but I know nothing about this genre of music, so I had to research it somewhere. Can I just say that I think the Grease track is probably one of the worst things I've ever had. <laughs> my ears. It is absolutely terrible in every conceivable way it's yeah. horrible there's uh, it has no redeeming factor about it it's just yeah. it is just a non-song for me it's, yeah. it's it has nothing going for it it's got a template fucking production beat to it you know anyone can come up with that on a laptop it's got like oh, I, I i can't even begin to fathom what kind of mental fucking inhuman like idiot would even buy this song they're out there and they're out there and like i, I don't know who they are but i would like no, they aren't buying them they're every, just streaming it well people know, start man. advertising on the back of it i'd like to meet yeah. every single person that likes that song i'd like to meet them personally and punch them in the face until we're both crying <laughs> so, so do you like it or I don't know. <laughs> oh it's a great tune. i love it <laughs> we'd have burst you wanted to say something, Al, I think. Oh, yeah, because I've got my notepad. I think we've all taken notes. Well, a few of us have taken notes. I think the fun, what would be quite funny is just to read your notes, just unaltered, and just say just what they say. For me, the first thing is, what is he saying? Something about Gucci. Like, honestly, I try. I, I rewound this track like two or three times. I had no idea. I couldn't make out what words he was saying. Like, is it either I'm really dumb or, like... At some point in production, he just kind of mumbled to such a degree. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. 
We are in Dangerous and the Grandad podcast. I used to listen to dance music in the car with my dad, and he used to bang the dashboard and say, It's bloody skipping! (laughs) (laughs) If you're you're going to reference Gucci in a track, then you probably need to have a word with yourself because that is like, even that's outdated. I'll I'll be honest, I'll be 100% honest. I didn't mind it for the first minute. I thought it was okay. I was like, okay, because I quite like. The sort of like laid back hip hop songs, you know, I like, you know, for example, like Rockstar by uh, Post Malone or something. I don't mind that sort of really laid back, barely putting any effort in hip hop that's kind of coming out at the moment. I'm kind of okay with it. But the problem is with this, after like the first verse, they just, the second verse, like, okay, I don't need to hear this anymore. Like, it could have been a, a one minute song. It had no, there was no point in it being three minutes. It was just everything they had within the first 30 seconds. It would it was over after that, you know. It was just it was pointless. It it is on a loop. I actually quite like the song though. I think it's a, it's growing on me as I've listened to it a couple of times. Dan, uh, you I, are banned. Well, <laughs> I should be banned. Uh, I want to provide a bit of a, count, a, a counterpoint. I think that the the vocal performance from Drake is pretty good. Now I like Drake. I've got quite a lot of his stuff. Hang on, hang on, just a second. It's full of auto tune, right? Yeah, <laughs> I could have talked about auto tune army. Yeah, it's it's auto tune, but Drake's got that sound. It sounds really cool with his voice. I think the texture of it. He sounds a bit like the weekend on this track, and I think it, it's um, it's a strong vocal performance. I think I, I would no, I would say no. at least he wasn't good. trying to sound like an English grime rapper or speaking patois in this mm. record, which he's done previously, which he cannot weekend, be forgiven for. At least the weekend have great production, you know. And yeah, it does have not. It has no production value whatsoever. No, I don't. I, yeah, literally. I don't. I, I agree with you there. I don't think uh, uh, DJ man. Khaled's contributions, whatever they are, are profound. It's uh, one one issue I have with, I think, a lot of his top ten. It's, it's, like, it's always been a thing, but not to this degree, where literally every song is some famous person featuring a less famous person who then next week is now a famous person. Like It just seems like every song is just a marketing tool. It doesn't even matter if it's good. It's just a marketing tool for the next person to be on the ladder to then market another person. Like, Alex, I think you've hit the nail on the head. This is I think not that's mu- rather cynical. This is, to this is not mu- This is not music. <laughs> How music. dare I? This is not music for people who enjoy music. This is music for middle management working in a call center, like just whacking on in their fucking I don't know their BMW on the way to work. They're wearing a sharp suit or whatever. It just it is just absolute marketing music. It's business. It's total business and that's my point with the whole top 10 actually it is all just business there's a lot of but, nepotism but wouldn't wouldn't patrick bateman dig that he'd love it he'd be exactly. well into it hmm. I'm, very much, I'm very much into my I, i'm very much in my patrick bateman phase i think at the moment uh, which i don't want to be misinterpreted as i'm currently stabbing people to death uh, but no, no I, i'm not doing that the, dave's the one with the bodies in his basement <laughs> <laughs> The as yet unconfirmed rumours. <laughs> Alleged. Alleged yeah, bodies, please. But yeah, I, I'm very much in my Patrick Bateman phase in that I think I'm really appreciating pop music at the moment. I, I like this track, although I will concur in that I do I do struggle to see where it's aimed at, where you would play this sort of song. It's it's not it's not a club banger, it's not a been introspective ballad, it's yeah, it, it's just music for nondescript occasion. What was yeah? What what's the song about, Whittle? Like, so I, I'll admit, I'm with you. I like it for about a minute. I like it for the first minute, but I genuinely couldn't get a word about the lyrics. I'm not sure whether I'm just deaf or a bit stupid, but might be a bit of everything. <laughs> but I had no idea. If you're unfamiliar with Drake's vocal style, it might be a bit confusing. I guess I, I listen to a lot of Drake, so do I have to put it for a filter? If that's what they're playing in Greece, I am never going to Greece. <laughs> I don't know. It's huge in Greece. It's Greece lightning. It's just, it's just dodgy like, music to wear curly shoes and eat hummus with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> I think we can all agree that was the hummus of music. <laughs> Fine, I, know, I, I, quite, hummus. I quite like hummus, and I didn't like this track. Next up for our, uh, for our probably collective uh, diatribe uh, will be West 10, a uh, song by AJ Tracy and Mabel. Yeah, that's in at number nine this week. I like this song. I'll be I also like this song. 
I did not like this song. I knew you wouldn't like it, no. Tom, because it doesn't have 20 distortion pedals. No, 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 it's not even that. Like, there is, there's, a, there's about, actually, most of the music on this list that I really don't like production-wise. So this track, like loads of the other ones, it's got really low-end bass, a percussion track that's virtually, like, non-existent, and then, like, a squeaky synth line on the top, and then a female vocal that sounds like they've just given her helium before she starts singing. And I think that sums up over half of this top ten. And the thing I actually... Re- I didn't... This isn't one of the songs I hated the most on this list. I think Grease by D- with DJ Khaled is one of the ones I hated the most. Um, there's others I hate equally. I didn't particularly hate this song. The thing I really didn't like is the lyrical content of the female part. I really, really didn't like that. And the reason I didn't like it I've never talked about relationships with people in in that sort of way. It's really confrontational. It's like it's demanding a it's demanding an affectionate response, you know. And I don't I, I don't like that. It just doesn't doesn't work for me. What were the lyrics? Okay, so yeah. the lyrics were: Don't you know I'm walking away? And if you don't want me to stay, only, 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 blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's that. Uh, you know I aren't, I'm not waiting for you. Don't you know I'm walking away? It's like, well, if you're going to walk away, just walk away. Don't rub it in my face. <laughs> oh, so, so your annoyance is that they <laughs> they were a bit snooty when like they did it. Like, <laughs> no, no, it's it's this it's this it's a really toxic way to look at relationships because it's it's. I I really object to the fact that we tell people that if their relationship is in trouble, they should be threatening to end it, you know, just either end it or don't, but don't put people in that sort of position. It's it's a really, I think it's a really damaging emotion, emotionally damaging way to look at relationships and to glamorize that in music. I don't think is effective. You know, nobody is, nobody's going to write a top 10 track about wife beating, are they? And, you know, and this is, this is emotional abuse. In the Chris Brown, right? He didn't, he didn't write a song about doing it though. Whereas this is, this is literally a female vocal about emotional abuse. And I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't like disagree that. though. I think there's a very big difference between I'm not being treated right. So I'm going to walk away. Or like I'm not being, you know. She's not saying she's not being treated right, though. She's saying she's saying to the the man, "I'm leaving you." It, it's a conversation that doesn't need to happen, you know. Just leave. <laughs> You're like the estranged father that just went for cigarettes and never came back. That's your style. <laughs> no, it's, it's, no, no. So she she's she's trying to start a com. It's trying to start a dialogue about an end of a relationship by threatening to end a relationship. And I don't think that's emotionally, that's an emotionally sound thing to do. You know, Tom, Tom, I totally agree with you. And I, as someone who is pretty much obsessed with toxic relationships, I totally (laughs) agree with what you said. (laughs) However, I think, unfortunately, that is how, um, how a lot of relationships are working at the moment. And like, I think it may be just mirroring what, uh, how a lot of people are feeling in a relationship in that yeah agreed just if it's not working fucking walk away just do it but you can't it's not as easy as that you can't just do that and i think it, it, to have lyrics the saying you know like you're saying like you know let just end it you know the reality is people are in these relationships and they don't really have a kind of uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I haven't. I don't think I've been quite clear. So what I'm actually saying, what I object to, is the fact that it's it's the threat of ending a relationship as a weapon. That's what I'm objecting to in the lyrics. Absolutely, in the lyrics. But that's how people work, and that's yeah. why the human race is shit, and we should all be <laughs> dying in a flood. Any well, that now. concludes but this one on the episode. episode. That's not a new concept for a song, though. I mean, there's hundreds of songs in the exact same principle and i dislike all of them for that reason aside from the lyrics i thought the production was really good it goes back to that whole like um the, it, remember in the early 2000s you had that whole bow selector garage thing going on oh god it yeah, me of, yeah it reminded it's me of really cool. 
It's very yeah, artful, artful dodger. It's so yeah. artful dodger. And I love that stuff. I'm all over it. I, well, that's I, what's I, kind of happening in modern grime music at the moment. They've thrown yes. it back a little bit too early garage, Absolutely. which is fine. And you get a lot of early house samples in modern garage as well. My and little I, cousin's very much into it, loves all of these rappers. Someone I, I, I recently really like, and they, they've been at a while, Disclosure. You know, it's all about that whole, like, going back to the whole... Um, 2000s production values of just like the, the garage thing, you know, just like, you know, dudes in a fucking, in a bed sit somewhere making music. People just do nothing. If it, if you have, yeah. if you ever watch any fucking comedy show on ever, watch people just do nothing about it's the garage. A good it's, it's a good It's so show. good. Like it's so good. And Throw your case yeah. up. I, I love that stuff. I absolutely, and I didn't at the time. When it was around, I hated it. Now it's like a kind of nostalgia fest in my head. I like fucking love it. Yeah, I fucking love that stuff. And so the production on that track is so good. It is so oh, yeah. good. Like it, but, it's lovely. I, I, well, I agree with you. You say like for me, I, I, it just sounded like late nineties. And the opening beat, I instantly thought of the Oxide and Neutrino song. Yeah. Yeah, like I swear they must have. I thought they nicked the beat. I don't found, know. found for the reload. Yeah, it's, it's exactly the same. I actually thought it was the beat, and I was like, oh yes. And the dude, to be fair to him, unlike a lot of stuff, he actually does rap. He's a good rapper. Like I think he's quite good. Yeah, he has some great flow. I, I was I was properly feeling this song. I was genuinely like, especially as yeah, I've heard the top ten in a long time. Like, for this to number nine, I was like, oh, thank God, there's a bit of hope here. That was pretty banging. Yeah, man. I think like, listening to the top ten, like, that we had to, we were forced to, under duress, <laughs> I was like, kind of, uh, actually, it, it was really refreshing. It was a, a I, I think West Ten is a great little tune. It, it's, I'm never going to, I couldn't even remember it right now, but, like, it would be something I'll never listen to ever again. But because I had to listen to the top ten, it was just a, a nice little break from the bullshit that I had to listen to before. I think it might be a British thing as well, because we listen to UK top ten, and I've noticed that some of my favourite ones are the UK ones, which probably aren't in the top ten in the US and around the world. Hmm. So it must be a, like it must be some, you know, a social thing just for us, because I heard that song, I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> like, I think it's, it's, it's much like the Tour de France, British <laughs> music than anyone else. I always used to like Garish for that reason. They would never like Americanify what they were doing. It was just talking about having a shower instead of having a bath or going to Woolworths to get pick a mix and early grind things. It's wrapped about whatever came to the top of the head. Oh, it's just that whole. It's the whole image of like you know East London tower blocks and stuff. I love that stuff. I, I really do. It's just evocative. It's very British. It's very English. It's very. You know, um, going down the local co-op to buy your four pack of beers or whatever—that's the kind of world we live in. And you know, this, that, I can relate to it. I can't relate to fucking Greece, like you know, you're on a fucking like big yacht and strippers and shit like that. I can relate to going down the co-op and living in a tower block. Oh, I'm the opposite. I can totally relate to Greece. <laughs> <laughs> DJ Alid. <laughs> I call I I. <laughs> I quite like the song. Um, I didn't listen to it with any any kind of lyrical depth. I didn't. I wasn't assessing that. It just took me back to two thousand three, two thousand four. That kind of garage scene, which I didn't really like at the time, as, as a lot of us have said. Um, and it's made me really kind of reevaluate my my relationship with garage music and realise, yeah, actually, some of those tunes are quite good. I went back and listened to. It's all about the stragglers. Um, and yeah, I liked a lot of it. it was, I'm remembering a time where I had Craig David stuck in my head for seven days and I hated that and I sent him a tweet. He never got back to me, actually. I did tell him to get out of my mind. Uh, but now I'm thinking, actually, I might listen to a bit of Craig David. So I do apologise for the vitriol, uh, Craig. Um, I hope we can be friends. So what's next? What's next? We have... Oh, complete toss. That's what we got next. No, ne- number eight was Harry Styles with... Watermelon. No, Awful. no, 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 no. It's probably the only redeeming. Well, I say the only redeeming. It's one of the few redeeming things about the top ten. I thought it was a well-written song. It's it's actually okay. It uses the four chords of doom, but not in a standard way that we all hear all the time. I thought it's well produced. Harry Styles has got a great voice. It's a nice song. It's just nice. It's okay. Yeah. 
I, I really liked it. I thought um, his voice was really good. Uh, it was, yeah, catchy little pop tune. I've had it in my head for a couple of days. It's a good song. Um, I like the direction he's going in, but I do have to say that Harry Styles is, is, is a bit of a sore subject for me because I, I clearly see him as how I would have been if I had been a pop star in my mid-twenties. <laughs> Coloured suits, big hair, a bit of a... Bit of a character. Um, I'm what, shagging the elderly. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I, what he does in his spare time. I, I I'm not. Think, I'm still not gone through that phase yet. But. I think Harry Styles is a bit like. Um, he reminds me of like someone like Bruno Mars, who is literally mm. just enjoying their fucking career and good on him. You know. Yeah, he's not. Why he's not? not done anything offensive. Why I think. Not? No, I, he hasn't. He, I quite he's, like, he's a good guy. And I, like. He, I have not have that like, great either. Like yeah, that's, that's that's why I hate Harry Styles. Yeah. Like if you hear one of his songs on a car radio driving somebody, you go, "Oh, that's unoffensive." But then that part of me goes, "Well, who's buying the albums? Who's listening to it?" It's the most. If I, I, think I don't, I don't know male that. pop star. Well, that's the reason the why I don't through. like it as well. Yeah, it's, it's so just generic. beige, tedium, just militantly dull. It's like having an yeah. eye bath when Bailey's. <laughs> See, I have it. It is really beige. It is really beige. But to be fair, I would rather that beige nonsense than the complete the, the very offensive. Thing I have I have Greece. some serious problems with the background of this song. For example, in interviews, Harry Styles and is it Mitch Rowland who he wrote it with have talked about how the novel In Watermelon Sugar, which is a post-apocalyptic novel that's actually very good, was the inspiration for this song and I was just like <laughs> what utter pretentious bullshit like I thought you'd love that then Tom surely the idea the if it had if the song had actually been based on the novel remotely then yeah I probably would have been well into that but also the lyrics, how have they read that book and come up with that I mean what kind yeah, of mad they, machine yeah, is their brain that's popping that out <laughs> they, they clearly haven't read the book and are clearly just trying to piggyback on something that's quite cool yeah, and, yeah. you know oh. it's 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 that whole sort like of people that name their band after something in Twin Peaks or people yeah. that have a big brother reference yeah you know, absolutely. You know what I liked about this song there's one thing I liked about the song I've got it written down like the trumpets towards the end <laughs> <laughs> the guy can obviously sing but like the backing music was just rubbish like if, if that backing music was played but in a random rock band you think well that song's terrible it wasn't very good like the chorus is quite frankly, it's not even catchy. It's just rubbish. It's not even a good mm. chorus. The, vocal, like, the, the lyrics are dreadful in the chorus. The lyrics are dreadful. And I mean, it's just radio fodder. That's all it is. Absolutely. I, radio I, like, I like radio fodder. Radio fodder mm. is good. Radio fodder does not get enough respect. It's the same same reason I have such disdain for people calling music cheesy. It's not cheesy. It's just how you perceive it to be cheesy. I'm okay with cheesy. Because cheesy, there's a reaction with cheesy. Cheesy, you go, ooh. That's a bit over the top. There's some reaction. This is like, like they said, the beige of music. There was no change in the song. It was literally verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, end. It's like the laziest music I've ever heard. And the only reason it's in the radio is because he's already famous. It's the same with Drake. It's, you don't, don't yeah. have to try anymore. Just having a name is enough to have a song in the top ten. Yeah, but I, I really started really going to run about uh, this one. So I, when when the song started, I thought, oh god, because there was that song from an older Harry Styles album where he sounded like he was trying to rip off nineties Robbie Williams, um, and I'm glad he's not doing that anymore. Uh, but when this song started, the opening verse, I was just like, oh shit, he's just trying to do the Kooks. So you know, his musical taste has moved from mid nineties. Robbie to early 2000s indie and then it went in a direction that pleasantly surprised me but I was glad that the song was under three minutes long that's uh it's still the best thing in the top 10 it's definitely not yeah, number so nine what we just went to talk about AJ Tracy that was way better I would I would actually say I hate to say it but this is probably Don't my favorite, this is probably my favorite of the tracks in the top 10 but yeah. I wouldn't listen to it ever again yeah and, yeah if it didn't exist <laughs> Exist, the world of music would be exactly I'm the just, same. It just yeah. does, it doesn't need to exist, but it did at least give me a bit of a break when having to listen to this fucking awful top ten. Can you imagine if that someone described your music like that? If, to listen to your track was a break. That's that's how yeah. bad it was. 
Ima- imagine having your but music at least it wasn't as, a break, as a break from all the other music we've had to listen to where there's like wet ass pussy and shit like that. Well, honestly, imagine. That song, hey, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> honestly, that song was so beige, I wouldn't even consider it art. I don't think all music, in, to a certain degree, is art. That was even art. That was just terrible. That was, if that's like if you're watching a a TV programme and the advert comes on and you get really into the advert more than the TV programme. That's how crap that song is. And you're all wrong, because it is a good song. I downloaded it. No, it's all right. Because I feel like I'm just doing all of the talking yelling, so please. I don't have a lot to say. I do have a bit of affection for Harry Styles and his One Direction. They, They did okay, you know, and he's enjoying his life. But yeah, it is just, like like Dave said, it's just beige. He's enjoying his life too much. He's put some more effort into him. You know, C minus, more effort needed. <laughs> it needs more wall of sound guitar feedback. That's what it needs, isn't it, Tom? Yeah, it did need the guitar yeah. solo at the end. I was waiting for it to come, and it, it just doesn't doesn't deliver on that. He should have given me a call. I, I keep calling Harry going, do you need a guitar player, dude? And he never responds to my call. Yeah, I did the same. Yeah. I said, do you want me to do some scratching halfway through the middle eight? That'd be wicked. Martin, bring back some rap rock shit. Martin, you, you are not allowed to call other vocalists. We've talked about this. Oh, yeah, that is true. By the way, I think what we should, we should point this out as one of the pros for this song is that it is just Harry Styles. He isn't featuring some randomer. Yeah, yeah. That's good. good point. Yeah. Point point for just simplicity. In at number seven, we have Mood Swings by Pop Smoke, the late Pop Smoke, featuring Lil TJ. Right. Um, my first thing. So it's weird being the person who mostly listens to instrumental music, have it going off on one about the lyrics in all of these songs. I yeah, do, I do see bad, them. I'm the lyricist <laughs> in the group, and I'm all I, I'm looking at my notes, and I've got takes me back to 2003. Nothing about lyrics. No. Shame on me. Shame I, on me. I really object to the lyrical content of this song, particularly towards the end where he talks about having sex with women off birth control and not want, <laughs> and, and not and not wanting to have a relationship with them i find yeah, i think does. that's i think that's just i think that's just a bang out of order um like it's all right uh, mary white house yeah, well, no, it's, yeah, it's, yeah have some fun about it like, I'm, yeah. I'm not i'm not going to brag on record about having unprotected sex with women who aren't on birth control and then not wanting to have a relationship with them if something were to happen i mean that's I just have friends completely who have out of order done that though <laughs> I, I know yeah. people who do that. Oh, there, there are there are pe- there are people who do that, but it's 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 not it's not something to brag about, you know. I remember when we were twelve and we went to a, a set. We had a sex ed day, and the child protection agency were there, and I think they scarred me for life when they turned, when they said to us at the front of the class. Well, they, they, the said, they said, "If you ever get a girl pregnant, and and we will we will make sure that you." It's your fault, and we will make you pay. And that was that was the, the the statement that was said to us by these two old ladies from the CPA. And I think that stuck with me ever since. So you know, I I would never. I think that scarred me for life so much. I'd never brag about having unprotected sex with women, and then I think those two them. old ladies were the ones that eventually took pot smoke out, gunned him down in the street for his bawling behaviour. But it does it does raise an interesting point, whereby how. Um, Women nowadays have way more uh, power over their own sexuality and their own sexual freedom than I think they've ever had in history. Mm-hmm. You've got that from pot smoke. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought this, a good was, thing. this was the opposite of that, if anything. Yeah, it is the opposite. I think it's, it's basically it's an affront to feminism. It is just yeah. the absolute opposite it is quite respect that yes. we need and it's very uncomfortable and i think what's problematic about it is that it's young women that buy this music it's young mm. women that fucking listen to this bullshit and mm. they, the, the messages that they're getting now 
this is their education about their sexuality, you know, mm -hmm. pop music. And yeah. uh, it, it's absolutely toxic. Yeah. It's very bad. It's very wrong. And not only that, but the music isn't even very good. It's just everything about this tune is wrong. It's just not I, wrong. I think I'm going to be the token person here going to defend this song a bit. Mm. Like, I think I've just got a, a soft spot for just complete trash hip hop that's coming out at the moment. I don't know what it is. A part of it, I, I, I'll honestly say it's rubbish, but a part of me is like, okay, it's not that bad. Like for me, with, when you're saying about the women's stuff, like it's like, it's like the, it's the ultimate form of like what our rappers do. It's just flexing nuts. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's so rich and so confident. He doesn't give a fuck if he's got 20 kids. He can pay for them all. It doesn't matter. It's not even a thought process to it. He doesn't have mm -hmm. to be bothered by the wake of his infidelities or stupidity. He's so minted. He's so talented. He doesn't give a shit. But that's, that's, not, that's basically the point of the song. You know, like, That's not a good message to send, though. It's really no. not a good message. So to send just, out. Just, just think, if it, if it was, I don't know, if, if I said those things in a public forum, I would be sacked and I would be all over the newspapers. You know, you like well, yeah, you you're, yeah, that's because you're a dentist, Tom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you said that to your clients. By the way, I was knee deep in this bitch last night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, now just think, drink a bit of that pink water yeah. and swell it around your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Was, oh, mate, you would I say you are. this bitch. You know, imagine I got this bitch last night. Of course you're gonna get sat there like what the fuck are you on about? But if yeah. I was talking to my mate at work saying, Oh, last night, oh me and my mate double teamed this hoe. <laughs> I'm, not gonna I'm not gonna get sacked if my manager hears me. He's gonna like, what are you bloody on about? You know, like the audacity of that statement, the over the top ridiculousness of it, that's what it's about, <laughs> isn't it? I, I have a serious problem with it in the sense that you know, young women are growing up listening to this stuff, thinking it's normal, thinking that that is how men treat women and that, that's normal, and it isn't. It's absolutely wrong. Well, and I disagree I, with I you, because you're coming at that from a male point of view. It's, it's like, I don't know what a woman's going to think of that song, but I can tell you what women think about their own bodies once we get to song number two on the list. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, wait, you know what I mean? You can, we can't yeah. say that on song number seven, where song number two is the polar opposite. Yeah, but you know what I mean. We, I, we, we, we don't like the that. same principle. When we like, just because we don't like it doesn't mean it's not normality and a normal thing no, to do. Now. I, I disagree. I, I think I think when we get to song number two, um, my vitriol will really come out, and the sense that it isn't normal to be objectified. It, that's mm. not how women should be. It's not. It's not right that women should be objectified. And so when Doctor Dre does it, is it cool? No, no because they, they, no, Doctor Dre doesn't do it anymore. He yeah. used to, but he didn't. And let's let's not forget, Doctor Dre is a fucking ace producer, but he also beat the fuck out of his girlfriend. And I fucking hate Doctor Dre, and I hate everything he did after NWA's first album. So you don't like any gangster rap where they slightly objectify women? Man, it's no. all about context. It's all about it. context. It's about context. It's this about... is some murky territory here. Yeah, it's well yeah. murky. It is. No, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's good. Like, no one, no. Obviously, obviously, no one thinks it's good, but it's almost like to a cartoonish degree, isn't it? Obviously, it, it, Yeah, good. I agree yeah. with you there, Yeah, Alan, yeah. Well, I can, look, I can get that. Doing it, yeah, but get look, that. Look, look at something like Tom and Jerry. It's still not fucking right to beat the fuck out of someone, okay? It's, it just mm -hmm. isn't right. But however, songs like this normalize it. And when you mm. normalize violence, that's when it becomes a problem. And when mm. you know, you're talking about, like, just, you know, just gonna point Dr. Out, Dre just, back in the day, you know, mm. cop killer and all that, oh, that was ice tea. But, you know, like going back then, that was a response to um, racism. It was a response to, you know, police brutality. This isn't a response to anything. This is basically going, it's okay for women to just be used and abused however you want to. And is it really? Is it, isn't, it just some, isn't it just some young guy who just likes having sex? Yeah, but th there are lots of other people out there saying, I'm a young guy having sex and I'm enjoying it. Prince, drink. And, then, you know, <laughs> hey, just... you only drink when I say Prince, okay? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Stop, <laughs> stop ruining the podcast talking about Prince. <laughs> There's a way of talking about sex that doesn't objectify another person. And there's a way of talking about sex. There's a way of writing about it. There's a way of writing very intelligent, 
mature lyrics about sex, and there's also a way of going, oh, I am fucking, you know, this fucking dude with loads of money, and I'm going to fuck all these women and get them pregnant, and I don't care. And that's the problem. What do you think, Dave? I just thought it was wank, mumble rap, and lazy good action. <laughs> I didn't really think about the lyrics at all. Right. Yeah, I, I, I didn't overthink the lyrics, to be honest. Yeah, I didn't I, know I, I've done that on virtually the whole of this top ten because I, the production on it, I, I find the production on a lot of these tracks, and I said it earlier, and, and I'll, I'll briefly repeat myself, is that it's very, there's no mid in any of it. It's all a low bass, a drum well, beat. And a wanky sense on the top. Yeah. And what I found that was most shocking about this entire top ten is that I just kind of flicked through it as quickly as possible, and I was skipping bits of the songs just to get through all of it. And when I got to the end of it, I just didn't really feel anything. You know, arch yeah. provoke a reaction, and I just mm. didn't get anything off of it. It was just I think oh I I've think heard this before. Oh, it's this type of thing. Oh, they're doing that thing. Oh, it's finished. I think <laughs> with, with the production, I, I basically I'm one of the notes I made, and I kept making the same note pretty much through almost every track. It's like. Um, I've been down to DBS and seen the students working down there and it's basically template music where it's like kind of, oh, you've got a template, whack it up on fucking Logic Pro or Pro Tools or whatever and there you go, there's your trap beat and it's just, let's get someone saying something offensive over the top and it is literally sounding all the same because it, it really does sound the same and that's one of the downfalls of um, digital working it's like mm. back in the day you know you'd have uh, Jimmy Page with Led Zepp um, who would spend hours upon hours setting up mics around a room around one amplifier just to get the right sound and it wouldn't be right and spend another few hours getting that fucking mic in the right place nowadays it's like whack up a fucking template beat and it all sounds the same because it really is the same it's exactly the same there's no kind of like nuance to it whatsoever there's no thought put into it there's no um working on it there's no like kind of well, i watched uh, sound right i watched 24 hour party people in the week and watching the scenes where they're sort of doing the production and moving drum kits up to the roof and you're using aerosols to sort of record to Absolutely. replace them air drums and recording yeah. just recording silence on the moors yep. in the background just doing loads of different production techniques just to make it sound different you know not to make it's it sound like anything man. else make it yeah. sound unique using using the fire extinguishers to get a fucking rhythmic beat on a joy division song you, that is lost now because all you need to do is fire up a laptop you don't even need a studio anymore you just fire up a laptop template beat Whack, you know, it's just, it's just too, too easy. And the, the one thing, the one note I kept making throughout this whole top ten was it's a template beat. It's just, it's a template. And, and there is, happy with it. I mean, it's, I agree. I think that there are some artists out there at the moment, um, one of whom I think features on the track higher up this list, who... They're using those template beats and they have something to say in a unique way. And I think it can work. However, I think that it, it enables there to be a lot more music out there. And I think it means there's a lot more to sift through. But there are still some special ones because it's um, like, isn't there the rapper Dave? Was, didn't he win the Mercury Music Prize or something? And I, I, I heard a couple of his tracks and I was like, actually, I don't hate this. He's got something to say and he says it in an intelligent way. And I, I quite liked that. So there is... So having the template beats can help some people, but I do find that it means there is a glut of stuff that I don't want to listen to. Yeah, it's also not an age or like time-based thing. Some artists like Bon Iver that are amazing do loads of uh, kind of experimental production techniques all the time and are releasing music now, so it's possible to do it. It's I just think hit, people are lazy. I think you've hit a nail on the head there, Dave, to be honest with you. I think that... Nowadays, people are less um, focused on production and more focused on the algorithm of what's going to work and get a chart hit. Oh yeah, and, you know, and you know, we all know the algorithm. We all know the four chords of doom. We all know the Max Martin production technique and all that stuff. And I think that production is where 
um, music has become so generic. Now. They're also not necessarily guilty of it themselves. If they're going to come through on the back of a struggling record industry where they're not going to take any risks and they've come through the back of maybe a talent contest or something like Hello Styles, then they're going to be tedium they're going to be the safe option they're not going to be taking any risks yeah no. I, I, I see i see modern music nowadays is much like photography everybody is a photographer we have mobile phones now which can um you know where you can take a photo which is just as good as a canon fucking you know dslr and you know you can make great photographs same with music it's kind of we have the technology in our pockets where anybody can make a great piece of music but people are not people are just doing the whole template instagram fucking thing over and over and over again and it's really really fucking boring so when, when you say the people are only trying to make stuff that's gonna be like that's gonna sell and all this stuff i think obviously it's the only reason we're saying that right now is because we're looking at the top ten. <laughs> like of the ten songs are gonna be exactly that, aren't they? they? They they only exist, they literally the top ten that we have had to listen to exist for one reason only, to make money. And that is what's the problem. It's the commodification of art and it's what's killing music right now. Well there was a, a yeah. clip of Frank Zappa, I think, in like the eighties, so in the interview on YouTube I was watching where he said um, the 60s were kind of great for music because there was this new wave of musicians and the old suits didn't really know what the hell was going on. So they just sort of said, yeah, crack on with it and we'll, we'll just see. But then those cigar chomping guys kind of got chucked out and then a new breed came in, the kind of new A&R man, and then they just didn't want to take any risks because like, they understood the genre, they understood what was going to work and what didn't and just, like I say, brought it down to that's kind of paint by numbers, hit, make it, parade. I don't really have a lot to say about this song. Um, it was just a bit dull. There was nothing that excited me about the vocal performance. Um, I think I really struggled to connect with it, and I just thought it was just there. It was just a bit abrasive. And I was reading about what happened to Pop Smoke. If you're not familiar with the story, he was killed in a home invasion in February. Um, I think it may be a case of the kind of po posthumous effect that, that sometimes can swing in, a, in an artist's favour and I don't mean to speak ill of the dead but it wasn't a great song um, but that leads us on to the, a song a bit higher up on the list which I'm a bit more enthusiastic about it was Laugh Now, Cry Later by Drake featuring Lil Durk Featuring <laughs> Yeah, another feature What is it with rappers names these days? Lil Durk I mean, There's all Lil's like, isn't there? Fuck off <laughs> Lil Peep and all that. Oh, fuck off. And that guy who's got like numbers for his name and stuff. I, I, I just, I kind of missed the days of like when the rappers had like really cool names like well, Ice T, Ice my, Cube. My theory on name. this, my theory on this is that most of these rappers are kind of early 20s. They're born in kind of 92, 93. And what was popular in 92, 93? The Rugrats was popular in that in that sort of time. Now, my theory is that Lil is actually short for Lillian. Um, and lots of babies were born at that point in time called Lillian uh, due to the Rugrats. So we can thank Rugrats for the current state of hip hop. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. Fuck you, Rugrats. Um, to listen to the top 10, I watched the music videos on YouTube um, and then ran them through my Bluetooth good speakers so I could actually get half decent sound. I know it's not the best way to listen to it, but it, it gives you the picture. The thing that really, really peed me off about this track was that at the very beginning, it says something like sponsored by Nike. Oh, yeah, on the video. <laughs> and, yeah. and that instantly, I was like, what? That's, 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 that's product placement. To, that's a product placement too far. You know, next we'll have ACDC, like, as you know, because you can buy Motorhead and Iron Maiden beer, can't you? So, you know, it's, 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 it's getting everywhere. But I really do, I don't, I, I realise that the money to make music has to come from somewhere. I totally get it. I do think that it's a little bit cynical to, to sponsor a music video by an artist from a sportswear brand. It just, it, it just doesn't sit well with me but I realised that it probably has to happen. To be honest, I don't like this track. Um, 
I find this new sort of soft, high-pitched Drake really dull, full of auto-tune, um, and just with very little to say. Um, there you go. I'm done. Auto-tune. As soon as I hear the auto-tune, I turn the right fuck off. I just... <laughs> no. As soon as you do auto-tune, I'm like, no. My biggest issue with this one like, is I've noticed it's a new thing in hip-hop and rap, and it's really going off because we are talking about it in the last song about production and that. I've, I've been on YouTube on a, a bit of a YouTube journey whilst on some herbal medication and <laughs> like and I, I went down a rabbit hole of just trying to understand like rap music today and I was li- watching all these producers with their like you know, with like they literally YouTube making the songs a lot of the time yeah and there's one thing I know for a fact is that the lyrics comes way after all of it like they'll make a beat the, the beat is what comes first every time and when listening to this and even in the last one that's the first thing you think of like I was listening to this song, and I, the first thing I thought was, they are just saying anything just to get through the song. Like, they'll say anything. It doesn't make, it doesn't have, it has no message or anything. All the, they, you'll see it a lot. They'll pause and just go, hey, hey, hey. Because they're just filling time. Like, that's what, if you listen to this song and I've said it again, Drake, all he does is go, hey, hey. Baby. Baby, yeah, I've even got baby. My notes have got baby question mark. What the fuck's that about? I like the back, like the music in the background. I thought was okay, but it really did just feel like, what can we say to get through the next three minutes and put a, a song out? The same the last one. It's, that's all it is. Let's just fill the time, just so we can put it out. Have like one of our mates on this song, so we can sell a million records to idiots, and that's it. So that's my run over. I totally lament the whole like. Um, way hip hop has gone. Uh, hip hop has gone very much exactly like you said. It's like just say something. Whereas back in the day, it was like no, they had something to say. So when I when I whack on like uh, an old Gangstar album or a Tribe Called Quest, they had something to say. Whereas now it's like you said, it is just like kind of let's whack some voice on it, you know, and let's just say some words, you know, and like th- th- there's not really anything, there's no message as such, there's, there's no uh, social commentary like there used to be. Uh, there used to be such a social commentary about hip hop. It's all about like I've got loads of money and I fuck bitches and I fucking go about in a yacht or whatever. Whereas back in the day, it was like, you know, um, fucking hell, man. My boys in the hood are getting beaten up by black, by policemen and stuff. And the, they had something to say about it. Whereas now, like... Oh, there's a track by Jeremy the Damager called Bullshit, which uh, does exactly that. He deliberately talks about his guns and his diamonds and his women, which he never normally does. And at the end of the song, you realise it's all a dream. And he wakes up and says, oh, fuck, that was bullshit. I never say no bullshit like that. <laughs> I need to listen to that. That fucking sounds so true. It is like uh, hip hop has become a such a commercialized, such a easy to go to kind of uh, music genre that like the whole message of hip hop has been lost. Hip hop when it first started, Dave, you'll know this. Back in the late eighties, you know, it was all about like the underclass it was all about struggling to get by and now it's like now they finally kind of realized their their you know they, they've got their aspirations it's all they talk about and like i i blame dr dre for it to be honest with you see uh, there is a part of me that's wondering what a lot of this music is for okay so i realize that's a silly question because most music is not really for anything but so like Dave alluded earlier when he was saying that he didn't feel moved by any of the songs in, in on this list. To give him his due, like I think one of the songs that's going to come up later, so I'll save a lot of this, is is trying to do have the sort of Katie Hopkins effect. I think Pop Smoke was doing that, possibly trying to do that as well, deliberately con- courting controversy with their lyrics to spark a conversation. Fair enough, I don't like it, but I can accept that. Um this song, what this song isn't, it's not a club banger. It's it's not a song that moves me anywhere. Um, it's not fast enough to have in a in to, to go to the gym to. So yeah, you know, struggling to see where its place is. Yeah, it's I don't. Just time. It's it's literally 
the only purpose I can see for this song is to either soundtrack TV adverts or to have on hold music from call centers and that's basically the only two purposes i can work out for this song i i can't imagine it doesn't move me at all it's it's not like i'm not gonna want to have to dance so to it in lift music <laughs> well no no it's it's not even good enough for lift music because it because lifts the speaker systems and lifts are crap so it's usually instrumental stuff in there so it's even worse than that it's basically pretentious clothes shops hold music for call centres and that's and and TV adverts, and they're the only three reasons that this song could exist. And, and to be fair, you, you can have sex in a lift, but if that song came on, it would put me off having sex. <laughs> I mean, I, I I'm kind of I'm kind of a wit on this. I kind of do get that laid back hip hop feel of like it was just kind of normal, like the normal at the moment, like normal. Sorry, at the moment, I kind of get it, but this is for me was just a bad one, like, but. All this new, this hip hop is just coming out of America, isn't it? Like all this, this top of the UK, and if the British hip hop is nothing like this, no, no, it isn't. It isn't. And this is Canadian. Canadian. Hmm. This Canadian Drake is Canadian. This is well, still he's not in, in Canada. He's not living in Canada, is he? I believe. I thought, like yeah. DJ Khalid is Canadian. I it's in Toronto. Canadian. Yeah. Well, whatever. Then I'm just full of rubbish. But <laughs> it's crap. <laughs> this I, new, new, I like Drake. I think he, he's got some really good songs. I really liked In My Feelings, uh, Nice For What. Hotline Bling was a, was a great song. It really... That was it, okay. It was uh, the memes that went along with it, obviously, introduced me to it, and I respected it. I, uh, yeah. I don't have any problem with Drake. I think he's a really that um, act, and he's got some good songs in the background. It's just this was... I liked that song song. from the bottom one. Started above, from, yeah. started from the bottom, now we're here. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah cool. that's a good song. And I, I, think, I, I consider Drake as the pound shop Kendrick Lamar. It's a different style to Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar is far more uh, in your face, far more um, politically conscious. Um, Drake is just a pop star. He's, he's, he's that's what he is. He's, he's not the really... Harry Styles of rap. Yeah, I'm going to mention uh, Atlanta again because it's a great program. If you haven't managed to watch it, Donald Glover's uh, TV program. Yeah. But there's a episode when they all get invited to go around to uh, Drake's mansion. It's this big party he's supposed to be hosting, and everyone's like clambering over each other to try and get an invite for that. And all they're trying to do when they get there is take a photo with him so they can stick on their Instagram to get more record sales, basically, or get them some clout somewhere. And they yeah. all go to the party and find out that Drake's just put a, he's actually on holiday and he's put a cardboard cut out with himself for them to take pictures with in the mansion. Mm-hmm. He's not even there. <laughs> That's amazing. I like this song. I, I would consider it a uh, worthy successor to something like God's Plan. I thought it was a, a decent banger. I've listened to it a few times since I uh, first heard it. I've downloaded it. It's um, I think it's great. I, I like Drake's delivery. Um, I do think the feature is a little bit needless, um, but I do like the, the kind of synth hook um, and what Drake's doing. That that baby thing is actually quite catchy. Um, and it's quite playful. And yeah, I, I like it. I think it's a, a good song. Um, I can see why people do like it. I'm not like 100% against it, but it feels a bit waffly to me. I can't help it. It just feels... It is quite long for a track that's not that complex but I, I don't mind it I think it's I think it's great and it's a good addition to what Drake's bringing um, I like his character I think uh, um, I do like the video he's kind of ex- experimenting with showing his kind of more emotional side um, trying to be a bit different to what what we normally see expressed from somebody in his position um so that was interesting um it's a bit corporate with the stuff with nike so there are some flaws to it it's hasn't not, he got his own sportswear brand there he's got ozo or something it's something like that there is an hour on it but it is nike affiliated i think like is, Jordan. i think, I think hip hop's the one like genre where it's completely acceptable for that to be a thing though isn't it mm. like as like as it's you know a lot of it for lack of terms, it's like it's just young black men getting paid. You know what I mean? Like that's their kind of whole ammo, isn't it? Yeah. Let's so, 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 so them to have like a, a 
a vodka in their like video, which has obviously been promoted. You know, it's kind of like part of the like I'm so popular, Nike will want a piece of me. You know what I mean? It's yeah. But in hip hop, it's weird because look at Snoop Dogg, and he can he will appear on anything, and he will make a feature really on well. anything. Um, but it doesn't. It never feels Just like it, det- it detracts from his aura. He's still Snoop Dogg, and he's still cool, despite the fact that he will put his name to some atrocious shit. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. He's gone away with Samuel Jackson, like. He, I think he's kind of running out of steam with that stuff. I think he's been in more rubbish than he's been good now. And he's, he's getting to that point where you go, hold on. He's at his De Niro point. It's the same with like Bruce Willis. Like, when was the last time he made a good film? <laughs> I think you guys hit, hit the nail on the head in the sense that back in the early days of hip hop, it was about young black men who were not recognized and who were struggling and who had to live in the ghetto and stuff. And they were trying to get their way out of it. And, you know, it was all about just trying to fucking, like, make something of themselves. Now they have. Now they have absolutely made something of themselves. And I think the whole, like, you know, aspirational thing, like, you know, you're you're a young black man living in the ghetto. What do you want? You want to get out of it and you want to fucking, like, a big flash BMW and stuff. And now they are actually doing that. It's kind of like, well, good on you, but also, like, don't forget where your roots are. Also, like, the struggle is what we like listening to. Once you're there, we don't really care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Like, I, I, you know, it's the my... same. That's the same in rock music as well, though. Look how many artists we loved on the way up and hated when they made it big. Yeah. Richard Ashcroft. <laughs> Can we talk about the next song? So I'm genuinely excited about it because I really like it. Yeah, from a song that I do like, uh, the Drake track that we just talked about, uh, number five was a song called Lighter uh, by Nathan Dorr featuring KSI. And not crediting the person who does most of the singing, I thought it was a bit fucking rich. Hmm, I didn't, didn't know about that. The, the main vocal is that Ella Henderson recorded a song um, that was a slow ballad, and they gave it to Nathan Dorr, who sped it up, put dance stuff underneath it. So he didn't write the song. That's that's mo- the majority of the song is a song written by somebody else, sung by Ella Henderson, sped up to make it higher. Um, and uh, she's not credited on it, which I think's uh, now uh, by the sound of it, she's quite okay with not being credited on it. But it does seem a bit weird. Mm-hmm. Also, sense. what's people's opinion of KSI and what do you know about him? I, I know nothing about him. At, at, the begin, at the beginning of the music video, he's a knobhead. Yeah. Okay, so he, I used to play a lot of FIFA at uni, and just got okay. high, basically. So there was no videos on YouTube or hell to get better at FIFA, apart from this one little kid who was making them, and it was this guy. So the reason he started off as a fame, famous person, basically, on YouTube, was he'd make computer games videos, and FIFA was one of the best ones. Oh, I didn't know that. No, no. I didn't know it. I thought his I thought his feature was just trash. Uh, I didn't didn't like that at all. I thought the whole track was just dull. I really didn't like it. Um, I thought it, the the first thing that came to mind is the, the gentrification of pop. Everything's so pristine mm-hmm. and so. Well, he's also yeah, not a rapper, this guy. I mean, yeah, he yeah. started off, you can literally trace him getting into the music industry on his YouTube videos. And he's terrible, absolutely terrible to begin with, and then doesn't really seem to get much better. I just don't think he's got a good rap delivery. He's not a rapper. He's just a kid who made some videos in his bedroom about computer game stuff and has become ridiculously famous. And he also has the biggest boxing grossing fight last year, fighting another YouTuber from the States. He massively went. televised. He did. It was against Logan Paul, I think his oh. name is. Oh, Logan Paul, yeah. Oh, no, um, but I'm also quite into boxing, and that depressed me that that was the most grossing fight from last year. Two, two non, it's basically like me and Whittle having a game of five aside, and that, that being the most televised football match of the year. It's just depressing for the sport. Nobody would ever want to watch me play football, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, I'll be 100% honest, I had no idea who any of these people were. I didn't know anything about that. I genuinely liked this song. It sounds it sounds bad. I think it's because maybe up to this point, there was just so much stuff I didn't really particularly like. Where just to have a bit of energy in the list, like, I kind of like, I've got a real, real soft spot for just 
dance music with a female vocalist just singing the whole way over the top. Like, under like, Castles in the Sky or something like that. It's very late 90s. This could have been on Dance Hits 98. Yeah, well, this right. is doing the same right. thing as right. the other tracks we've talked about, um, harking back to 90s and early 2000s, House and Garage, basically. Yeah, and I don't I think, I don't think that I element of the song is bad. I just think the rapper KSI, well, it's ludicrous to even call him that, is shit. I actually didn't mind the rapping. Can, can, I didn't know about anything about him. Can we I just, thought the rapping was okay. Can we just do away with fucking guest rappers in songs? Just, oh, man. Uh, I, sorry, going to disagree with you, Alex. I, I thought the song was great. It was okay. But as soon as the rapping started, I'm like, oh, my fucking God. Turn that off. Oh, no, I agree with you. It didn't have to be there, but I didn't think it was that bad a rapping as a whole. It just no, didn't, it, I agree it, okay. it needs to be there. It was okay, but it added nothing to the team. I can just almost hear him trying hard in the rap. It's, like, not natural, and the delivery is a bit off and clumsy, and the pronunciation is weird, and the timing's bizarre. He's trying to cram syllables in where they shouldn't really be. It's just terrible. Like, you can tell it was attempt to number 100. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a hell of a lot better than Black Lamborghini, which he released on YouTube, if you'd like to look at that, which is an absolute disgrace. Oh, God, I don't, want I to... don't really want to check that out, if I'm honest. <laughs> I, I just personally found this song just really catchy. It's sort of one that if, if I was to hear it in a nightclub at one in the morning, I wouldn't dislike it in, in, the, like, in the slides. Like if, if I was in the radio, if I was like in the car and Harry Styles came on, I'd go, ugh. And then that one came directly afterwards. I'm like, oh, yeah, all right, yeah, I'm on a bit of this, you know. Mm-hmm. Maybe not my usual cup of tea. I won't go out and listen to it, but it's I've the got sort to admit, of... I thought it was okay. It just has to have a bit of enthusiasm in a song almost, you know? It's the sort of thing they play at a Zumba class or an Aquafit class, isn't it? And yeah, so exactly. yeah. this, this track actually has a purpose, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to rag on it too much. It's Getting Granny's note, bingo wings my, shaved off. Yeah, absolutely. My, and and for my, that, no, my notes, my notes said uh, about this track: if it came on the radio and I'm stuck in a car and I can't get out of the car, I would enjoy it for what it is, but I would forget it at least like three seconds after the song finished. It just feels like a late nineties dance song, and yeah. I'm at that point in my life. Where that's completely fine. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm it sorry. Is fine. It, it takes me back to a few years ago when I had an unhealthy obsession with getting sunbeds, and I would visit um, the sunbeds, and it's the kind of music they play in a, in that kind of institution um, that you listen to whilst wearing nothing but a pair of goggles, trying to accelerate your uh, your demise. I think one one way of describing that song it is literally. School run mum, twenty seven year old single mum, prosecco <laughs> night. Fucking, you love this analogy. <laughs> I do. This love is that. one of those. This is one of those songs where you listen to it once or twice in, like oh, it sounds a bit generic, or whatever. But then it will come on in like three months time, and you'll re- you'll recognise it and instantly go, oh, I like this song, but you won't know where from. You know what I mean? We want to make response by like, oh yeah, I know this is a tune. And then we're like, what? What is it? No idea. <laughs> I've just I, I, heard it. It's okay. I, I think it's more likely that somewhere, some nondescript time in the future, Al, you're going to get a text message that just reads, "You wanker," <laughs> and then you'll realise that I may have been in a co-op while this was playing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, hard you know, FM fodder, isn't it? Though it is yeah. literally local radio fodder. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure whether I genuinely love this song or if it's a case of I dislike the other songs that much where this is a real stand-up for me. Yeah, contrast effect, man. <laughs> Total contrast effect. The rest of the songs in the top 40, the top 10 we had to listen to, were so bad, this one is okay. It flew just like a butterfly. <laughs> oh, That's a no. segue. <laughs> segue, segue into into num- number four, which was "Ain't It Different" by Heady One, uh, with AJ Tracy again and Stormzy, Stormzy making a, an appearance there. A song that I really didn't like, and all my notes say are "Crazy Town." Do you know what my yeah, notes well. said? Do you know what my notes said? Ain't it different? No, it isn't. It's exactly the same as pretty much every other song in the fucking top ten. I my, my notes, boring. My notes, no joke. It's just butterfly question mark. Lol. <laughs> like, who the hell would use that as the as the sample? 
Well, the thing about that is it, it was originally a sample of a, it's a, it's a red, yeah. Yeah, pr- pretty little ditty. Um, they used that. Milk, no, yeah, they? yeah, they used that for that song. So now we're sampling Some, a sample. Somewhere, mm-hmm. somewhere, John Frusciante is going, I fucking like the bucks rolling into my bank account, but my God, I wish I hadn't fucking written that guitar bit. Like, I've got a few problems with this. Like the chorus, straight up, wasn't very good. Like all the rapping, I felt was competent. None of the rapping was that uh, bad. I really don't like Heady One's delivery. I think it's it, it's it just sounds. It sounds like he's got some sort of speech impediment, and he talks. Re- it's it's like you can just imagine him talking really slow, with and just it just sounds a bit <laughs> like when Stormzy raps. He actually sounds like intelligent and fast speaking, and I actually quite like some of his stuff. Yeah, when I Hedy, do. Mind him. When, when, when Hedy One raps, he sounds like the stupid guy sat at the back of the class blowing raspberries. Stormzy on this song straight up steals the show. Like the first two, the first two guys, are like okay, if you can say the one about Hedy One's delivery. But a lot of rap music is a case of if they sound distinctive. It's the whole reason why Lil Wayne's popular. But like, but as soon as Stormzy started, I was like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. He's by far the best in a bunch. But I got annoyed by this because this is the ultimate offender in I'll just put other people on so other people listen to it. Stormzy is in this song to sell the other two easily, right? I actually timed it. I timed it because I couldn't believe how quick his verse was over. He was rapping for 24 seconds. Wow. Yeah. That is it. That's all he did. He, I, I've i had a lot of farts. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like what happened in... Do you so? Do you remember how films used to get advertised by being produced by directors of other famous films? Yeah, so mm-hmm. that you would watch them. From, this is ex- from the director of Lockstock. Yeah, that yeah, the makers so, of Blumbo. Well, like, director had a hands-on like. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. I don't, I'm not to, so, like, Guillermo del Toro would produce other films. So you'd have... Guillermo del Toro is a great director, and I love loads of his film. I love pretty much all of his films. And Labyrinth. And Labyrinth. Yeah. It's just beautiful. But he would be attached to f- other films as a producer, probably mostly just to sell the film, rather oh, than having the creative input. And I think that's... That was happening, uh, that used to happen a lot and still does. And it's it's like Christopher Nolan being attached to Superman. He didn't direct it. I'm not really sure how much he did with Man of Steel, but it, it helped sell the film because you'd oh, go... Oh, people onto it as well. Because producing, yeah. you didn't make it. You just set up no. the people to make it. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And so that's this is the musical version of that. It's so that if... So Stormzy's 24 seconds on this track will mean that it appears on the Spotify playlist of, of, of whatever recommendations on people who like Stormzy. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's piggybacking in the same way. Mm-hmm. Do I blame the artist for doing it? No. Do I like it as a practice? No. Um, so I don't like it. It doesn't mean it's not right. I mean, it, collaborations between artists weren't so prevalent as they are now, but they have always happened. Do you think of a bit song as well? I genuinely think it would have, I would have liked it more if it didn't have the butterfly sample. Yeah, like, maybe. I genuinely thought it, I thought it was distracting. It didn't yeah, really, it's quite distracting. With their rap style and what they were saying, it didn't really go with it, did it? No. no it just felt a bit weird. I wasn't on board with it. Well, I think that this is a case of, again, we're talking about samples from the 90s and 2000s. They're using these because the people that are listening to it don't have any recollection of the original coming out. So they know that it's a hell of a catchy hook, but it's worked in the past before, so they're going to use it again, and they know they're not going to get pulled up on it because the people that are listening to it never heard the original. Yep, I agree with that. Yeah. I, is it bad that I own Butterfly by Crazy Time as a single on CD? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> you are absolutely banned. It's, well, it was before I got into like rock music properly, so it managed to catch me that exact time before I first listened to The Offspring, and I was still listening to pop on like what the music channel was back in the day, The Box, wasn't it? Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. I, I I have no particular problem with that Crazy Town song. I mean, I, I wouldn't buy the single, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's, it's a pretty like competent it. track. It's awful. Nah, yeah, it's come, it's baby, pretty... come, come, my baby, you're my butterfly. No. It's pretty much a nadir of it, 
Yeah. Poser skaters trying to look cool and make with nonsense lyrics and just is just a bad use of that that nice guitar lick. Um, and this is more of the same. Uh, Stormzy I quite like, but I didn't think his appearance on this all 24 seconds of it. I also just... think Stormzy is shit and he's the most overhyped grime act to ever occur. How he's got so popular, I have absolutely no idea. It's because he's quite good, Dave. Yeah, he's, he's, he's it's, terrible. It's a charisma thing for Stormzy. He's quite charismatic, and he um, he gets himself over. He's like a he's like a baby face wrestler for uh, <laughs> the wrestling fans out there. Um, but yeah, Stormzy's okay. Um, this isn't particularly memorable or interesting, and yeah, there's not anything that I can really take from it. So I don't really think there's much more to say. <laughs> song by bts okay <laughs> oh, i really want to hear i really want to hear what alex has to say about this song <laughs> so no track number three dynamite by bts now we we have to be careful with bts because they have an army out there so if they get wind of us potentially putting down the the k-pop phenomenon that is bts then we we could be in trouble so i think we tread lightly here but al you, you say you, you want to tackle the subject well, I, I had no idea who these people are. I, I've never heard of them until, like, about four hours ago when I listened to it. They're huge. And, and I, yeah. my girlfriend currently is try, is learning Korean. Like, she's trying to learn Korean because she likes having productive hobbies, unlike me. But <laughs> So I actually mentioned, I actually sent her a link to this song. I'm like, oh, have you heard of these people? And she said, all of the my Korean teachers on YouTube rant about how much they hate BTS. I had no idea they were so popular. And in honesty, I'd fuck all of them. No homo. They're all so sexy. They look like girls. I'd fuck, I'd fuck every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we say that on here? Yes, it's oh, staying in. It's staying they're just, in. That's all they're, the so, they're so pretty. Oh, the things I do to them. <laughs> I thought they kind of looked like androgynous trolls. They all got different coloured haircuts. And... <laughs> it was, I've never seen such, like, at least with Koreans, at least they don't even hide the, like, just mass produced a boy band you know what I mean they, they didn't even hide it this song was straight up just boring and rubbish the whole way through it felt like S Club 7 didn't it it, it did have a bit of an S Club 7 budget I actually quite liked it I, know I was quite watching good. it oh. the whole time I was thinking I guarantee they get 50p for this song <laughs> yeah. none, of, none oh. of those kids got a penny if you look into the way that the, the K-pop schools and stuff it's it's really it's pretty grotesque really the way that these these places run so they they go through like academies to learn to be K-pop stars and they're treated abysmally and and uh yeah um so although although they are probably rich now they've probably spent a lot of time being uh milked as cash cows by their uh, owners um, We've all got scars on their back from the whips. <laughs> yeah, or um, like it's it's when you read about like the the girls developing eating disorders and stuff in these places, it's it's really it's it's really really brutal. And and I, I won't be able to talk, but it was a long time ago I read this article, and I think it's something that if you are into K-pop, I think you should read about. This is where I go like. I'm a vegetarian. I have no problem with eating meat, but I do think people should understand where meat come. Who do want to eat it should understand where it comes from. I think you should feel the same way about K-pop. I think if you like K-pop, you should understand where it comes from. And I don't necessarily approve of that place. But no, completely different. Changing the changing the tone because I I don't want to be the bummer again because I did it. Last <laughs> <time>. <laughs> the bummer. I think um, I've covered bumming. Oh, uh, <laughs> you, you did. <laughs> We've had enough. We've had enough oh, bumming yeah. for one evening. <laughs> <laughs> Poor choice of word. Okay, I don't want to put a downer on the conversation. I did enough of that last time. So I was in Russia in 2005 watching music television in Russia. In uh, yeah, they're, 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 it's it's and the the pop music in Russia in when you watch Russian music channels because it was basically the only channel that worked in our hotel room. The pop music was like late 80s. English pop music, so they were just like 20 years behind. And I think K-pop, the reason why people in this country love it is because it reminds them of 
pop music 20 years ago in this country. So it's it's the new version of what... So 12-year-old girls, their parents will be, what, 30, in their, in their mid-30s? So we'll, remember, we'll have been the kids growing up to Backstreet Boys. So the reason K-pop's popular is it reminds the little girls of the music their mum listened to. Um, and I think in the same way that I liked Radiohead because my mum liked Can... You know, it's 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 those sorts of things. Um, and, yeah, so Korean pop music, in the same way as Russian was, is like 20 years behind British, I think, and that's how it feels musically. Like, I'm sure it's part, I can't channel my inner 12-year-old girl, but I imagine it would be like back in the day with, like, you know, people have their favourite Spice Girl. I'm sure they have their favourite member of BTS who's, like, the yeah, sex one. Oh, like, he's a sex Go on there now. Go on there now. Which one is your favourite? Oh, no idea. They all had makeup on and they looked so feminine. I just couldn't even... I couldn't get over how this is cool now. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow. Like, it is a bit strange, but I, I think it's... Uh, like, Yeah, it's just good pop music. I don't think there's anything... I thought it was quite generic pop music. That was my problem. Yeah. I mean, it's not their best song. I think Boy With Love they did last year with Hobsey. That's probably my favourite BTS song. Uh, but... Yeah, this was quite good. Wasn't this supposedly like their first English language song? Yeah, it's their first all yeah. English uh, yeah. lyrics. And you can and you can tell because the lyrics mean absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. And that makes it better. <laughs> It it's, it's more like the, the, the opening lyrics with the guy in the video where the guy stood in the bedroom and the lyrics make it's just a string of different Backstreet Boys cliches strung together into a, into a verse, um, and yeah, I wasn't I wasn't into it. Um, it, it. It's but it's not music for me. It's it's music. It's music for twelve year old girls to dance to, and that, so it has a purpose. And me. Yeah, it has a purpose. <laughs> it does something for them. It's pretty inoffensive, really, which I imagine is why Martin hasn't said anything because it's so yeah. if he has nothing to say. It's not aimed at me. Oh, drink. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's Martin's catchphrase. It's housewife music. Just like mood swings by Pop Smoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, I'm dropping my kids off to school in my Ford Focus. I'm wearing pyjamas. I've got her FM on. Yeah, it is a nothing piece of music for me, to be honest. I, I got nothing from it. It's inoffensive. My notes here say, it's okay. <laughs> That's about it. Well, you do some heavy research, Martin. <laughs> I've got I've got better ways to spend my time. I'm I'm reading about Joy Division. You know, I'm not going to be fucking researching BTS. But like they're probably point. more popular right now than the Beatles were back in the day. That's how yeah, deep they yeah. are, and that's tragically yeah. depressing. We should we should know who they are because of that. Just alone. No, well, we, we do now. Know who they are? Yeah, we do now. We yeah. shouldn't. We should ignore them. We should just ignore that whole fucking scene. It's my, my biggest issue with this song isn't. It's because if when I hear K-pop, it's the same reason if you hear like some ultra European pop song. Like there's going to be some bits which are so amazingly like European for those songs, or so something that's so amazingly co- like Korean, where there's such a culture difference, it, it's, it kind of comes off as almost weird, but because that makes it more endearing. Yeah. And this song didn't have that. It didn't have the usual thing I would like about a K-pop song. Where I go, where did they get off thinking that was a good idea? It was just, it was just like a B-level Backstreet Boys song, wasn't it? Yeah. Do you know? Do you yeah. know what I can't get over? Why don't they sound like Goldfrap or someone like that? Just why don't they add some disco glam to their Beige fucking boringness. Is this they are name? not beige. They are oh, the most. So they're the rainbow. They are the rain. They're oh. skittles in pop form. They're basically. They're basically. BTS is the equivalent of getting gang raped by the Teletubbies. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That wouldn't oh. be beige, though, would it? <laughs> that would definitely not be beige. <laughs> this no. episode of the Cacophony Sessions podcast is brought to you by Subtlety. <laughs> Dave, did you have anything to say about BTS? Uh, <laughs> K-pop I know nothing about. I don't agree with it. Um, I've got no interest in it. I can understand why people have. Um, obviously, it's aimed to be as inoffensive as possible for small girls and 
adolescent Korean people. So yeah, I'll <laughs> echo Martin's opinion and say it's not aimed for me. It's I've got no business talking about it. I won't yeah. be listening to it again. I didn't find it one way or the other as per usual, but I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. It's I'll just move on with my life. <laughs> what does it stand for? It stands for I, I will say this wrong. So it says yeah. it says Bangtan Son Yundan. Oh, of course. Also known as the Bangtan Boys. <laughs> Bangtan Boys. <laughs> that's what that's really our band name if we get in the band. Yeah, the Bangtan yeah. Boys, and they're they're hitting high. They're hitting the heights there in at number. Th- Three in the UK charts, which is oh, we're getting to number two now, are we? Are we're we getting, finally getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah, um, BTS is surprisingly popular. Number three, it's a uh, K-pop phenomenon hit, uh, hits the shores here. Um, and speaking of phenomenon, uh, then the next song it is a track by Cardi B featuring Megan The Stallion, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have. Some things to say about this. Fun not, fact: It's now number one this week. It, it, it is. Number oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. With this song, okay, like <laughs> I, I, I cannot I, wait. To I, I, as, as Dan, as as Dan will know, I. Re- find it really uncomfortable listening to songs about sex in general. Okay, I'm. I have no problem with the fact that I am a bit of a prude. You know, my favourite band is Smashing Pumpkins, and I don't think there is one sexual reference in any of their back catalogue. And I, <laughs> I, I find I find sexual references in songs really uncomfortable. The the phrasing of the lyrics really uncomfortable to listen to. However, I also think that that's sort of the point. Yes. Okay, so the music and the production is awful. The lyrical content provokes a response and I think that uh, I think that I understand what they're on a political level. I understand what they're trying to do, and I don't have a problem with them doing it because you know men have got away with objectifying women and and in rap for years, and so they're up, they're out there and they're they're doing what they're doing and, and great, okay. But I find it really uncomfortable to listen to. Not not because purely for the the language that's used because I'm approved not because I have a problem with the message that they that they're trying to portray but I just think at least if you're going to make that sort of message at least have slightly better production on it like um it's the Katie Hopkins effect though isn't it you do you make something that's so offensive or you say something that's so offensive or deliberately designed to offend people like Ben Shapiro that it gets a conversation going you what know what's wrong with the production well, you said you said a few times the bad production uh, but it's, bad it's, about it's, production? It's, there's like musically, it's just like bass underneath. I, I just didn't. There's musically, there was there was just nothing going on other than the vocals. You could take the music out of it, and it would sound basically there, the same. There is, there is no music to there's that track. There's some pause in this house. There's, there's no some music. pause in this house. Yeah. There's some pause there's, in there's this no house. melody. Yeah. There's no. There's there's nothing. It's basic rhythm. However, what I will say, the history of rock and roll is about basically just cavemen knocking rocks together or whatever you know and like that's what it is it's the most primitive form of music i've ever heard in my entire life and well there's some interesting bits about this song in the fact of carly carly b was a stripper and come up on that scene and one of my pet genres that i really like is booty house basically or footwork depending on what you want to call it but it's predominantly made for strip bars and titty yeah, bars. Do you, and... Just in, do you just invent genres, man? <laughs> I'm pretty sure he does. <laughs> I love it. I'll uh, link you to them, but yeah, they're, they're, it's fucking great. I really enjoy it, but it's, the lyrics are often ridiculous. Um, <laughs> I would say, I'm really into post foot. <laughs> Well, there's a <laughs> the probably the most famous example is DJ Salt Ass and Titties, if you've ever heard it. No, I haven't, but they sound oh. pretty great. I'll, uh, I'll slam you over a playlist of them. This it's ludicrous, but they are designed to be played in tip bars, basically. So she's come up from that area and she's leaning on that. So Chicago, Detroit, or whatever, have great big sways of. Um, tip bars and they're massively popular they'll go there and they'll play high volume 
bassy sort of dancey hip hoppy stuff for strippers to dance to and people will spend thousands just chucking one dollar bills all over the place yeah. so that's what this song is alluding to basically but I, I think I, I'll, I'll be honest man like I, I can't identify with it <laughs> like, I'm saying that but I, 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 this is one song in the top ten I actually had heard before because I think it was just one of those ones. It's, it's such a cultural thing. But like, wow, this is this is allowed now. Mm. But like, I I love it. Like, they were so over the top with like their sexuality and like, oh yeah, sit. On, I'm gonna sit on your face and you're gonna take it. That's something. Sort of Where like, I even felt a mild uncom- mildly uncomfortable. Like, oh wow. Like, mm. but I loved it because of that. It felt like I was reciprocal. Like my mindset. I'm on the other side of, like, what all the other, like, male rappers have been objectified by women for for years. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I, I loved it because of yeah. that. I, 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 thought... I respect that. I totally res- I should point out, I totally respect that. Um, it's I find it uncomfortable to listen to, but I totally respect what they're trying to do. Do you think a prostitute is empowered, or do you think they're being oppressed? I think they're empowered, empowered. because they know what they... they ah. anything. In that scenario, especially, you know, obviously, other than disease and safe stuff, like... <laughs> Because they know what they're worth. They know what people are willing to pay for it. You see what I mean? Like, the person paying for it is one really being exploited. But do you not think putting a value on that act is in itself cheapening yourself and is going to erode your mental health quite badly? Not not if you put the value on yourself. You see what I mean? Like, it's not like someone goes, I'll give you a tenner. It's like, no, if you want to do this, you give me 500. Like, there's a difference. Well, it's normally because they're addicted to drugs and they didn't really want to be doing it in the first place. So then you start thinking, well, instead of, you know, having to deal with all my problems and being dope sick, I'll just let someone fuck me and then I can get through the day. So it's not exactly them putting a value on themselves. But without getting into a massive deep conversation about oppression and feminism and everything else, I believe that... I I think we've we've covered feminism earlier. Yeah, I I think she's... uh, Dave and Alex have both equally valid points in the sense that, yes, I totally agree with you, Dave. Like, you know, that there's a lot of, um, you know, socio problematic things about it however alex is also right in saying that like it's about women going this is my body and i'm going to do with it what the fuck i want you know and i i actually I, this was my favorite song in the whole top 10 and here's why it's because it is just in your face woman it is just like going mm-hmm. do you know what i don't know i do not give a fuck what you think i'm a woman it's my body I'm going to do with it what I want. And it's, it's fierce, like, isn't it? I'm going to, it is yeah. fierce. Yeah, it I'm, is. I'm, I'm going to shove my fucking tits in your face and it, it, you, you've got no choice over it. And I absolutely applaud that. Like, you better fuck me right. Yeah, it, 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 really, it really is. <laughs> like, and, and me, I, as you all know, like the whole podcast, I'm a total feminist, absolute 100% card carrying feminist. Uh, a song like this, it's a piece of shit, but it is a woman saying, this is my body, I'm going to do with it what I want. And yeah, but the juxtaposition to that argument is this. She was a stripper. She technically was a sex so worker. What, man? Like, good yeah, on her. But good she on has her. this opinion because she's already been oppressed by society. So Yeah, maybe. Maybe oppressed, but she's taking yeah, this, control again, of that This whole, oh, it's an incredible uh, act of feminism standing up for itself. It's not. It's She comes from a damaged point of society and has been exploited and she has a, the incorrect opinion. So, yeah, yeah so I, by I, all I, means. I know, no, 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 I know someone whose sister is a stripper, like, and, and I've talked to her and she at no point had that opinion herself. She isn't a drug addict. She didn't do it out of exploitation. She did it because she knew she could make, like, you know, 300 quid in a night. I mean, don't get me wrong, those other strippers do exist. I 100% agree that is awful. But... Most of them, well, not most. I have no idea how what a proportion is, but a lot of them don't have that. It's like I don't get offended by the idea of male strippers, for example. Like mm-hmm. a group of like women, like middle-aged women, wanted to grab a guy's knob doesn't bother me. And a lot of the blokes, I'm sure, do don't really mind either. 
No, I'm there's not, sure. not, that, not that. I'm not at all saying that that's the case. And uh, what I'm just getting slightly riled about is everyone's going to say how this is a great song because yes, yeah, she's floating a woman head around and whatever. I just have that particular opinion. I think that you know maybe she's been warped from the previous career that she's had, and that's not a normal opinion. It's possibly not the greatest yeah. thing to be shouting about, but I don't I really care. I'll tell you what a good way of putting it is actually because I know I know what you're getting at. A good way of putting it is it's like back in the like the 90s and like 80s it's when a lot of rappers would say the n-word like yeah it's good they're they're re-empowering themselves that they're saying the words and all this stuff but then a part of you goes well they yeah, had it's to coming in, from a point of oppression yeah, yeah they had to do that in reaction to the oppression in the first place yeah i think it's a similar I mean, thing, in, an, in an ideal world you wouldn't have the bad thing to react to in the first place but yeah and i agree with that yeah and that's the thing. I understand I think, that that's not I, real life. I I, <laughs> I I totally I totally agree with what Dave is saying, but I also agree with what Alex is saying. And like, I come from a, I, I work with young people who, um, you know, I've I've worked with young people who have had to get involved in sex work and stuff, and it, it's a horrible thing. But it's like this Cardi B song. It's her choice, and she is absolutely empowering him, empowering herself. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, how much of it is her? And how much of it is a producer, a male producer, probably? And on top of that, the music is shit. It's a fucking yeah. I mean, I'm not really that bothered. I'm not music. running out thinking, oh god, it's going to warp the minds of everyone. I don't really care. Yeah, I okay. mean, if we're dreadfully honest, this is going to be. Again, 18, 19 year old people getting pissed, shaking their ass in Oceana to this music. That's really yeah, not going to yeah. change the landscape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. I thought the rapping was quite good, didn't it? Yeah, I thought she had a good flow. Uh, yeah. but there's, no, there's no redeeming factor to the song itself. And, I you think know, you're wrong. I think it is. Well, I, I disagree. They're, 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 she's not doing anything that two live crew didn't do back in the early 90s. I disagree in that. In that, I think she's a woman doing it is is something different. And uh, Cardi B has done a lot of tracks like that. And she's she is an, a gen, she is a genuinely interesting act. And she's she's talented. She's charismatic. She's got something to say. And now that she has the platform of the popularity to say it, I think it's actually quite an important message. And I think the more I think about it, it's quite an important song in that it, it does it's it's a bold statement for freedom of expression. And I am very much an advocate of that. In 2020, so I'd like to say, is is this song any different to what Madonna was doing when she did her sex book and it's, uh, like her It's a fucking, continuation you know, of that. Grandma. It's a total continuation. It, it is literally a woman, in, you know, t- taking back the, the sexism that is rife in music that we we've all experienced. You know, we've all had to listen to the toxic male you know, thing going on in music. And it's yeah. just like, you know, going back to like Madonna and, you know, the, the, the early pioneers of female empowered, like, you know, hmm. uh, artists, she, she's just taken it to the next step where it's like kind of, she just made it pornified basically, you know, and like, okay, right on. You know, I will say though, like in my notes, I wrote, the lyrics were probably written by a 14 year old boy who just discovered pornography. <laughs> I've got to admit, yeah. I really liked the music video. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Like real. I <laughs> love the music video. Yeah. I could watch it over and over again. <laughs> it, is, it is particularly uh, um, aesthetic form of art, that music video. Uh, come on, we, we, we all like a bit of ass, you know, come on, we all do. And there's no getting around that fact. It's there's enough to go around. There's what enough to go around. Apparently, I don't like a little bit of us. I like a lot of us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, 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 it's very, very, it's a caveman thing. It's like, you know, we are hardwired to respond to sexual things. And it, that, that's what it is. And it just, it, it works on that level. It is a overtly sexual thing. And fucking more power to it. I, I, it's the, literally the only worthy thing in the top ten. That that, uh, that track is the only. And I'll never listen to it again. I'll never watch the video. I, I, I'll forget about it. But it's literally like politically, 
it's making a point that we all need to like fucking stand back and have a look at. It's like we are all hardwired as men to love a bit of ass. Oh my god! It felt like I felt the opposite, where it was like she was such a woman. Like it, you could give me like a hundred attempts, and I still couldn't lay her right. You know what I mean? Like, it gave, I gave the impression I was just yeah. like, wow! Like, <laughs> like yeah, I she, she would. She I'm would not man enough for her. You know, she, like, she she would probably eat us alive. Yeah, exactly. Us up and like you know, be nothing. But again, that's the point. It's about the female empowerment. It's about like. Yeah. Yeah, you know, put in that position, she would fucking kill us, man. Like, you know, as men. And that's the beauty of it. The intimidation was quite a journey because you listen to it thinking, started off quite shocked at the lyrics. And then gradually over time, there's this this realisation that I had that, yeah, I, this is kind of the other end of what's been happening in music. And I, I'm comfortable with the fact that this is something that should be talked about and I think the journey that it took me to realise that was quite was quite interesting and that's why I think this is quite an interesting song and, see, and you're dead right it is something that needs to be talked about I think that it's, it, it raises the point of female empowerment it is so important it's, it's probably literally the most important thing that we should be talking about Mm. there's some there's some things that i find a bit weird about this song because on the one hand it has sparked a conversation you know any song that pisses off u.s conservatives i'm pretty happy about you know um and if it, if it starts a conversation that's great i do feel very uncomfortable about some of the lyrics but then that's just me and that's my own insecurity and i've got no problem with i have no problem with that i also object to use of lots of swear words and things in lots of other music as well um what I find odd is that this this song has sparked a conversation. Um, like you look at Russell Brand did a video um, where he just, he questioned whether it was a feminist masterpiece or porn. The problem is that the the conversation then becomes really really divided, and I think that it would be so much nice if we could just have a civilized conversation about this. The other thing that I find a bit weird that t- sort of ties into what Dave was saying, I was just doing some research while you guys went off on one, and there was a refix of the song released by a guy called Safari, um, and he's done a remix of the song, which is B-A-D, or Big Ass Dick. And um, <laughs> It was always going to be that way. There was, you remember uh, no, no Scrubs got a, a male remix called No Vultures, it was originally called, but got changed yeah. to No Pigeons. But Cardi... No B. pigeons. <laughs> Cardi B has reacted fairly positively to that on Twitter, which does seem a bit odd. I don't it's like because when um, the the male retort to the female led songs always came out in the past, the original artists never used to be particularly keen on them. I didn't think. No, we kind of missed the point. If you, if you want to listen to a song, which might as well have just been a retort to that song, but it was written like 15, 20 years ago, there's a song called Bitch Better Have My Money by a yeah. rapper called AMG. <laughs> and oh my God, that's, it's literally the most... I've never heard a song where he is so sure of himself with his sexual prowess. <laughs> like, honestly, his, one of his lines is, I don't charge by the inch, I charge by the foot. <laughs> bitch, don't believe me. Bitch, have a look. <laughs> like, it's one of the best songs, rap songs I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I, find that, I don't think I'd manage. I think I'd find it too uncomfortable. <laughs> Do you know what I find so incredible about that is... Alex actually did a bit of research. <laughs> I just knew the song. It's just, it's like uh, I, there's some rap lyrics which always stick me. It's like um, one song, one of my favorite lyrics of all time is I think it's Ice Cube. I'm gonna back up in your ass for the resurrection. I think we can all agree that WAP. The one thing that I can't get over is how it's so wrong. In how can you have a wet ass pussy? What the fuck's that about? You know, it's anatomically incorrect. I think we can finish <laughs> off. I think we can finish off talking about this. Where it's what Fry said was very divided. It's, that's the best way of saying it is art because people yeah, have yeah. people can't make up their minds about it. It is yeah. art. It is art. Yeah. It is pure art. It's art. It's it's interesting. It's thought provoking. It's designed to to get people talking, and that's exactly what we've done. I mean, we talked about this the longest. So Dan, what's what's number one? Yeah.
interesting conversation about track number two, WAP. Uh, number one this week is Head and Heart by Joel Corey featuring M-N-E-K. Um, I don't have a massive amount to say about this track because I thought it was quite boring. What about you guys? So catchy, man. I, I would 100% agree with you, but there's just some jump to it, if you know what I mean? And once it hits that chorus and the music kind of simplifies, I can imagine myself really humming it after listening to it, you know what I mean? Like, well, I did. <laughs> you know, so, like, I thought it was good. What I find really odd about this song, right, so it's only in the charts because Joel Corey was on Geordie Shaw and he was a dick on Geordie Shaw. I don't know why. I used to end up watching Geordie Shaw late at night when really drunk. Um, I've watched every episode of it. Just gonna have you? Yep, I, I have watched. I've watched a lot. I've watched a lot, and he wow. was a, he was a dick on Geordie Shaw, right? And so he's only got a music career because he's a personality that's been on telly. Um, and I watched. I was watching Saturday Kitchen, right? And Joel Corey performed. Oh, people can't see me doing air quotes for an audio podcast. So he performed, in inverted commas, this track. What he actually did was he stood behind basically a cassette player, pressed play, and then stood holding a head holding headphones. I don't understand, like, don't get me wrong, m ks vocal on this is actually pretty good. He's got a decent voice. He's described as a rapper on Wikipedia, and mm. it, what he does on this track isn't rap, but mm. it's quite good. And Joel Corey, who also works as a fitness instructor, has basically just taped another dance track from a Zumba class and stuck it underneath it. And that's what it sounds like. Now, so he's basically made a record to sell fitness videos, um, you know, or something like that. So it's got a place. There is a purpose to this music. And, it, yeah, it's got a good beat to it because it's a beat that's designed to do a spin class to. But it's not something I'm going to listen to again. No. I thought I thought it was quite catchy, but beyond that, I didn't didn't really appreciate it. It didn't hit any, any, it didn't hit any chords with me. I think it's the catchiest song we've had on the list. The chorus, especially. That's, like, that's not really setting a high bar, though, is it? No, no, I, 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 would, no. I would say Watermelon Sugar is probably the catchiest on the list. No, I'd, no. Because no, the chorus lyrics, are, so the chorus lyrics in this one aren't that great, but at least they make some sort of sense, unlike Watermelon Sugar. So I'm with Alex on this one. It is probably the catchiest one on the list. I'm not saying yeah. I like it, I don't, but it is probably the catchiest song on the list. We'd it uses an annoying Sorry. production technique, which a lot of dance music does which they kind of pan down on the beat so while your bass drums coming in the gain for the whole rest of the track apart from the vocals will bounce up and down with it to give it more pop it was used by like Swedish House Mafia originally when I first heard it but it's just an annoying production technique which bugs me like, so I'm not a DJ I've never made music like this so I, that would go completely over my head like I, I like you, like I said, I just thought it was quite catchy. My biggest issue with it is just it's a bit short. It's like two minutes thirty for a club song. It is a very, it is a very short song, which I quite liked, to be honest. <laughs> you really didn't like it. I'm surprised. I did. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't go for it at all. It didn't. It didn't really strike me. There were five songs uh, in the top ten that I did download. Uh, them being uh, them being West Ten, uh, Watermelon Sugar, Laugh Now, Cry Later, Dynamite, and what. And not this one. So I think, like with this song, I think the reason it's two and a half minutes is because Joel Corey gets paid to do DJ slots, and it's something that he can slot in with a load of other tracks that are around about the same BPM and mm. in the same key, because it's in the same key, key and at the same BPM as a lot of other dance tracks. So I imagine that's the reason it's short. It's I don't convenient. know, Dave, Dave, Dave will know better than me about that. It's, it's probably an extended version. It's probably short because it's been made short for radio play, and that's the version you're listening to. There's probably an extended version which will be released for clubbing purposes. I can't remember this song. I'm going by notes. Um, I actually can't remember most of the songs on the top 10 I listened to them all in one go two nights ago uh, and my notes basically say who is this for <laughs> in, me uh, I loved it who <laughs> the fuck is this aimed at it's for it's, Alex yeah. Alex and Zumba classes <laughs> I, yeah. oh, my I name like Zumba music yeah. so <laughs> I, 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 I can't I, see you as being a Zumbist 
I, I, I played this song to my mum and she, her response was, it's the sort of thing that I will end up hearing in an Aquafit class. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, it's I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what this song is. It's... 27-year-old single mum dropping the kids off to school music. <laughs> Drink. Are we going to have to start drinking when he says that as well now? Or? Yeah, I think so. Realistically, it's an average song, but for me, with an above-average chorus. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I think that chorus is, is catchy enough to, to carry it. It is, it is a bit of an earworm, but it, oh, it's just, it doesn't offer anything new, and it just feels like a continuation of that lighter song by Nathan Dahl. Yeah, uh, they're very similar. It's yeah, like similar. It's, there's this sound. Yeah, this kind of, I remember that song from, um, is it Jess, Jess Glynn? Yeah. Um, it's very mm-hmm. similar to the yeah. kind of pitch she was having. It's just watered down house music that's set to a pop song structure. Yeah, and it, it's, it, yeah it's just, it doesn't do anything for do me. You know it's funky just, enough, there's no it, rawness to it. And I know I go on and on about pop music uh, being important, but th- there's just something that doesn't feel authentic in this. Do you know what, Dan? You you hit the nail on the head there. Stop saying that. <laughs> yeah, right. Your board is so full of nails that are slammed so far into it, you're going to have difficulty shifting that. It's it's too compressed. It's mm. just way too there's compressed. There's no life to it. There's no, no life. There's nothing. It's had the life absolutely strangled out of it. It's Imagine like Sa- it. Shang Tsung has come along for Mortal Kombat and warped its soul out of his body. <laughs> Even more. Imagine a cat, right? You've got a pet cat. And you love your cat, but you love it. <laughs> Meows when you get home from work and you strangle it to death. That is what <laughs> most of the top ten sounds like right now. I don't know, like, Compress like... the fucking life out of every bit of musical idea that you could possibly have. Just compress it to fuck. Just fucking, like, compress it, strangle it, grab it around the neck, and just squeeze the life out of that poor little kitten. The only fucking track that means anything in this entire top 20 is that stupid WAP song. For me, this entire top 10 has just highlighted to me that I like I like that type of dance music, apparently, where it's Zumba class. Apparently, it's just highlighted me. I love that. It's just that I can't help it. I genuinely love it. And I'm on board with a song as long as there's some slightly above average rapping. <laughs> yeah. that's all I need to like a song Well, and then there's a Drake song where I think that's probably 90% of the population hence why they're popular yeah that's true <laughs> well, the problem is what you're saying about this song being bland and it annoys the turd out of me that you were into that Harry Styles song <laughs> 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 like, how dare you say that about that song where it has 20 times more life wow. in it than that Harry Styles song <laughs> Harry Styles song didn't have the change of tempo no. like, his voice has a nice texture in this song it's like going to a carvery and and they offer you three different meats one is lamb one is beef and the other is spam like, it's just <laughs> it's mechanically processed it's not music it's the mechanical reconstruction of music uh, and it's just the gentrification of pop to a degree where it's so diluted that it has absolutely nothing I know. Of any you know, I'm going to go on record right now. Fuck Harry Styles. <laughs> uh, fuck that guy. Is, are you adding that to BTS? Or? <laughs> uh, I would like to fuck. You got a lot BTS. of bumming to be done. There. Fuck Harry Styles. <laughs> I think. I think Dan. Dan, you've hit the nail. Right. Stop saying that. <laughs> I think Dan has hit the nail on the head. I said that deliberately. <laughs> Right, this you, podcast you is going into the floor and the last number one is the worst <laughs> you are on point in saying that like modern pop music is so commodified it's so compressed it's so like it's the same thing over and over again and that's fine that's okay but I, you know it's rammed down your throat as well if you're going to have shit rammed down your throat, at least fucking put some variety in it. At least give some flavour to the shit. Some I think the, pro- the problem with... I kind of disagree with you to a point, because I think you're saying that as, as a person where this isn't their genre, but if I was let's say love this and talk about your genre, how many bands sound like Pearl Jam back in the day? How many songs sound like 
Yeah, loads did mine. They no, loads they fucking did. did not. No, no, no chance they're not. they're not as good as you think they are. <laughs> <laughs> there was... no, I, actually, Alex, I, Alex does have a good point there. Look, they're crunchier. Think, There's I, loads of them. No, I think yeah. we, we have to like consider that context of like the fact that I'm a 46 year old man who liked grunge back in the day and stuff um, my listening experience is very different to a 12 year old girl who would love all of the stuff that we have been forced to listen to in this top 10 I, I will say they have the whole top 10 WAP by Cardi B is the only song that actually has any merit I disagree with you. I think there's a few that are okay. I think I think WAP will will hold up. In t- I think WAP will probably be remembered in a few years' time for better or worse. I don't yeah, like the video. I don't, I don't. Yeah, well, for whatever. But like, I don't. I don't particularly like the song. But I think that will be remembered in a few years. Yeah, I think time. everything else will wash away. Yeah, I think everything else will wash away. I think that song will reverberate for a while. Like I say. It's not for. It doesn't do it for me. I find it uncomfortable, but I uh, I appreciate. It's not into it, us, is it? No, I, <laughs> I quite liked it. I'm going to add it to my. I'm going to add the video to my favourites. <laughs> <laughs> I think, other than WAP, I think the other song that I'll remember in a few years will be uh, "Laugh Now, Cry Later" by Drake. Um, I do like that song. I think that's going to resonate with me um, for a while. So I like that song. Watermelon Sugar is good. Um, I like that West 10 tune, but I'll probably forget it existed in a few months. Um, Dynamite by BTS again, probably forget that one. Um, so it's not it's not the most memorable selection of pop that we've uh, that we could potentially listen to. It might be an idea to revisit some uh, retrospect charts in the future uh, or maybe look at across the pond I looked at the charts over the last couple of decades and back in 1990 on this day uh, D-Light, uh, Groove is in the Heart was in the top 10 and yeah. I I miss I so miss days when something so fucking like incredibly brilliant as Groove is in the Heart was being played on radio like you know constantly all the time every fucking day none of the songs that we are listening to now in the top 10 they're not gonna be memorable but are we going to have a top 10 where a song as memorable as that is going to be played again do you know what do you know what mine Hit the nail on the head. With that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nail on the head. I promise, like, I, this is this back to my original point. Though. So we'll say none of these songs like will be in like twenty years' time will be like uh, popular or whatever. But like to a twelve-year-old girl who's listening to the charts now, when she's thirty-five, she will look back on those songs the way we're not going to. Like she will remember, or that that guy will remember them fondly. It's the same as like my mum not looking back fondly on the songs I look back fondly upon. You see what I mean? Yeah. Like to her, but like, oh, oh, yeah. good case. Obviously, like, nostalgia has its place, and we've talked about this before as well. Yeah. But yeah. I still look back to all periods of time in music. So if people can only look back to the music they've heard when they were younger and can't look any further back, then they're not music fans. I, I agree. I agree with that. I, I yeah. But in in fitting with my Peter Pan complex, I do try and keep abreast of current music. So I do still think that these songs going forwards will have some meaning for me. I haven't stopped listening to new music, and um, I yeah consider this part of my musical canon. New, new music to me is so foreign. It might as well be its own genre. You know what I mean? I'll just think of there's young people music. That's now just a genre. And I'll put all of that music in that one genre. Think that way because there's plenty of new music coming out all the time, which is from every sway of genres and from every aspect of yeah. music. Yeah. Like no, Tom was saying his, his favourite band released a new album this week. But well, no. I can honestly say this has been my favourite episode. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it, it has been a hot one. 
to sum up, I uh, I think it's been interesting and it's been good to get out of our comfort zones and discover stuff we wouldn't necessarily listen to. Um, and I think if I want people to take a message away from this podcast, it is to get out there, discover new things, push your own boundaries and listen to something that may, yeah. may, makes you feel uncomfortable. And discover because that's the best thing to do and that's the joy of discovering new music. Mm-hmm. And I think the moment that you, you stop doing that is the moment that your mind is uh, switched off from being in touch with what's popular and what's uh, what's going on in the culture and I think that there's something to be gained from staying in touch with that kind of thing. 100% agree Dan. I, I, I mm. totally yes. agree and I thank you for this because like I would never have listened to the, the recent top 10 if it wasn't for some homework you know and um, the fact that I was forced to listen to this dire terrible music um, It's but, made you a better you know, person yeah, it does. It does. You, you, sound, like, you know. sound more delightful in your in your tones. Of- this has been an interesting episode for us to make. I'm not sure whether it will be an interesting episode for people to listen to, but it's definitely. No, I think it will. It would be. It, it's the sort of episode I would want to listen to. Uh, however, I will say, Gish is the second best <laughs> one album ever made. <laughs> it's six. 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 You six. are kidding me. Six. Uh, well, I think we're trading off. <laughs> As we trail off into the Smashing Pumpkins yes. distance. Dan, hit us with the outro, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll put Tom and Ryan out of their misery and declare that none of them are the best albums because the Smashing Pumpkins are hugely overrated. And on that not true. And on that bombshell. On that bombshell, we bid you adieu. As we say good night from the cacophony sessions. Good night. From the cacophony sessions. Can I go last word? Bit of levity, guys. I'm on the last word. The last word. <laughs> Fuck Harry Styles. Good night, people. <laughs> <laughs> Farewell and stay funky. Big ass dick. Big ass dick. If I said those things in a public forum, I would be sacked and I would be all over the newspapers. Big ass dick. Dick. Big ass dick. I don't normally drink that much.